Investors Chronicle. Hello and welcome to the second episode of Lee and the IC, the new podcast from the Investors Chronicle. My name is Alex Newman, an associate editor at the magazine, and I'm delighted to be back in the FT studios again, joined by Lord Lee, aka the ISA millionaire, aka John. If you didn't catch our first episode, which we recorded and released about four weeks ago, uh, I'd encourage you to go back and give it a listen. But if you listen to our September conversation and might need a refresher or just want to dive into this conversation and want to know what it's all about. The idea of this podcast is slightly different to the episodes that normally appear in your feed. So for a start, we're not here to analyse or interpret the latest company or market news, though we will touch on that, Um, but rather to explore investing through the eyes of one of the UK's most seasoned and successful personal investors. And that person is Lord Lee of Trafford, also known as the ISA millionaire to some of you, and to you and me, dear listener, for the purpose of this conversation as John. So to do that, you can think of this podcast as a sort of extended conversation with John, drawing on his decades of practical and personal experience as an investor. Um, At this point, I should throw in the disclaimer that though we will be talking about individual stocks and John's portfolio in detail, this podcast is purely for educational purposes and nothing in it should be taken as financial advice or recommendations to buy or sell shares. This month, we're going to be talking about John's largest holding, which also happens to be one of his most successful all-time holdings, um, as well as the art and challenge of knowing when to sell. Uh, and catching up on recent trades and changes John has been making in his portfolio. So, John, a very warm welcome to you in the studio today again. How are you doing? Fine, thank you. I don't feel very successful at the moment, given what's <laughs> happened in the markets over the last couple of years, but seasoned, I, I go along with it. I'm quite happy with seasoned, okay. yes. Lovely. Well, we'll we'll, we'll come on to success and uh, uh, its ebbs and flows uh, in due course. Um, I said in my introduction that we're not going to be overly forensic in our dissection of recent market events. But I'd still like to get your thoughts on a couple of big developments since we last um, spoke here. The first is what seemed to be a kind of capitulation markets at the idea of this for higher for longer interest rates um, theme. And and the second, of course, is the the rising geopolitical tension and, and war in the Middle East. What's it been like as an investor to digest the events of the past month? Well, I, I think it goes goes probably beyond or further back than the last month. Mm. Uh, it really has been a very difficult and challenging couple of years, uh, and we've had a, probably two or three major negative factors. We've obviously had, going back, the Ukraine situation with rising interest rates, which now look as though they'll, uh, they've probably peaked but may well remain at a higher level for, for uh, longer than people anticipated. We've also had, because of pressure on family budgets, uh, some investors, uh, retail investors, selling out of uh, funds that they're invested in, and therefore the funds themselves ha- have to have had to sell down some of their individual holdings, which obviously has depressed prices. Uh, and now, of course, we've got the uh, you know the terrible situation in the in the Middle East, which is clearly going to drag on for for some time, uh, has an effect on oil prices and adds to the uncertainty. So the combination of all these factors really has made it very, very difficult and markets are are, are fairly depressed. Having said that, uh, I think there is a, a fr- I think it's a French saying which, which more or less uh, says, uh, sell on the trumpets and buy on the cannons. Mm. But, uh, my view is at the moment, um, you know, the market offers uh, in many areas extremely good value and I really do believe there are, you know, there are great opportunities. I and mean, obviously, if there's a major world war or similar, then, we, you know, we're, we're, I'm afraid we're, you know, we're all in a mess. But under any normal circumstances, this time should present and does present, in my view, some excellent buying opportunities, particularly because of some very attractive yields and real undervalu- undervaluations of, uh, of companies. It's a very hard question to address at a high level because it's essentially about pricing risk, isn't it? It's trying to make sense of a very unpredictable and often volatile-seeming world. Do you have to operate as an investor from the basis that things will improve and that most of the noise that investors have to deal with in markets turns out to be, I mean, while, while very significant in many ways, does turn out to be noise for the purposes of um, of you know growing your wealth in the stock market? Yes, I think... Uh, I think... Uh, you do to be an investor. I think you do have to uh, 
broadly take an optimistic view of the world and the world economy. And after all, some of the underlying factors like you know, growing world population uh, and um, broad brush increasing wealth obviously will will increase travel and tourism and, and similar. It's clearly going to um, to be of long-term benefit. And, of course, the other point is that, that you know, if you do have surplus funds to invest, uh, where are you going to put them? Now, of course, uh, you can put them under the bed, but that doesn't make great of sense in terms of um, inflation spending power. Yes, at the moment, you can obviously put them in, in a bank, uh, and get quite an attractive rate of interest now, maybe five, five and a half, six percent possibly. Uh, but those rates aren't going to uh, continue for forever. Maybe they might for the next, you know, nine, twelve months, as it were. Whereas uh, if you get into and invest in in equities, uh, and you're you're coming in now at, at, at dividend yields of of you know six, seven, eight percent. Um, in some of the larger stocks, we've mentioned them before, the Avivas, the Legal and Generals, the M&Gs, or you're dropping down to some very solidly established smaller caps, you can also get a 7% dividend yield. So, I mean, even if our collective focus is, has been dominated by these huge stories um, over the past month, the music of, obviously doesn't stop for companies and businesses themselves. Among the many to have provided an early autumn trading update in recent weeks is um, Treat PLC, which um, reported positive sales and profit growth for the year to 30th September. Treat, I know, is a large and, and, and long-term holding of yours. Can you just briefly walk me through the company, what it does, and, and how you came to be invested in the shares? Mm. Well, I first bought uh, Treat in, I think, about 1999, so nearly 25 years ago. Mm. So you certainly could say I'm a long-term supporter and uh, uh, and holder. And at that stage, of course, it was a much smaller company. Uh, it was then family controlled, quite like family controlled uh, businesses from a stability point of view. And from memory at that stage, it, it had a dividend yield of about about 6%. And it looked to me a you know, good, solid, smaller company of just the type that I, I like to invest in. What, what were his operations then when you when you started? Well, it was it, 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 the, the operations uh, fundamentally haven't changed right. uh, in that uh, essentially it provides it provided and it provides uh, ingredients. Um, it, it use just one word: ingredients that that go into drinks it's it's predominantly focused on the on the drinks sector particularly in the US and the UK it has uh, plants here uh, it had a, a historic plant at Bury St Edmunds now it's got an absolute sort of state of the art new plant and invested huge amounts uh, in this new plant that i've seen which is really really very very impressive and a similar uh, plant in florida uh, supplying the the american market now it it seemed to me when i bought it that you know, here was a, a, a unique, quite a valuable business, probably more valuable than the market uh, w- was was rating it, and really quite a unique business in flavors and fragrances. And we have hardly any. I don't think there's another quoted company in in flavors and fragrances. I suppose the nearest might be, in some respects, a company like Croda, but that covers such mm. a whole range of uh, uh, of other products. And generally speaking, uh, flavors and fragrance companies are valued much more highly in Europe and on the continent than they are here. Uh, And in fact, the majority of the the big companies, the big world companies, are European or continental companies, whereas Treat is is much smaller. Mm. So it it, it attracted me in in fundamental terms uh, as a business that that was fairly unique for the UK, had a good dividend yield, uh, as I say. And uh, over the years, I've probably bought it on... uh, Oh, I think over 30 occasions, right. uh, and that's tended to be my approach, really, to um, you know to try and identify a good company. If I like it and it's growing, then I put more money into it. So I probably bought um, over th- over 30 times, um, and of course, uh, you know, the company has grown significantly, and um, because of its profits growth, really achieved a very very high rating. And of course, that's what you're looking for as an investor. You're you're really looking for the double whammy of absolute profits growth and also an upward re-rating. Mm. And that, that's the real double kicker yeah. that actually propels a share price forward. And so going back probably four or five years, maybe a little less than that, you know, Treat had, had um, two or three profits upgrades 
in one year and the shares really went up. I think probably at peak they were, you know, maybe uh, almost on a sort of 30 or 40 price earnings ratio. So very highly, highly rated. And, and my holding was worth a lot of money at that yeah. stage. It was by far my, my largest holding. Now, what we've seen with, with Treat uh, and I have to say a number of other smaller successful holdings has been quite a significant derating mm. in those companies. Um, companies like Lock and Store, companies like Amparo have come down because of that the the the, the lower rating that is now uh, that is now given to such companies. And of course, any company that does actually suffer a, a, a profits fall, uh, as, as Treat did mm. uh, eighteen months ago, uh, then twelve eighteen months ago. Um, then the the market reaction is is pretty negative mm. and and uh, and pretty savage, frankly. Probably over probably overdone in many cases. But uh, at the moment we're in a market where good news uh, if a company announces you know the profits in a trading statement are you know, going to be ahead of expectations or or it's really buoyant, they might go up four or five percent uh, on on the first day. Um, like very recently, uh, Cerulean and uh, Hollywood Bowl, and they go up four or five percent. But then um, investors and one or two of the fund managers, I think, see that as an opportunity to take profits, yeah. uh, and the price then you know, drifts back to to what it was. So it's very difficult for companies in share price terms to make headway in these markets. But it's very easy for them to go the other way. Yeah, and I suppose the temptation with you know, treat. I think. It's clear to say they're an enormous success story. I think I was looking at the the long term share price, and I, I think uh, in the decade to twenty twenty one, it was um, it, 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 the stock rose something like twenty four fold, compounding an average of thirty eight percent a year if you if you include dividends, which is kind of unparalleled, really. I suppose the danger is when you have such a success story, which is both a product of the company's own operational strengths, but also as you said, the market's valuation, the re-rating. The re-rating yeah that when, when things, you know, do moderate or we do revert to the mean a little bit, that investors can't see past what happened. You know, we had we had an enormous um, success and, that, and it's, it's, it's almost trickier to look to the, the future because, you know, this escalator of share price appreciation is, has come to an end. So just trying to understand the, you know, the, the valuation now, I mean, it did look to me like it was, it was pretty, it was, you know, it's pretty uh, very top, raised, topply very high rated. Yes, yeah, yes. I mean, now now we're you know, it's a much more sort of manageable eighteen times forward earnings. Some would say that's still a little bit a little bit high. Operating profit margin and return on equity, you know, it's hovered pretty steadily in the mid teens. Respectable, not necessarily earth shattering. What, what's your sense from where we stand now after this? You know, two tricky years for both investors. I think, yeah. I think in broad terms. Uh, I would say certainly historically it, it was uh, overvalued right. and probably now was somewhat undervalued. Right. I was very pleased with the, the recent trading statement which confirmed that um, you know, profits were up to expectations, particularly pleased that they reduced the headcount um, because of the move to the, the new, much more efficient right. site by 14%. Uh, and uh, particularly pleased pleased with the reduction in the debt. I think the debt had halved, and I think they they're really expecting to you know to get that even that well down over the next twelve mm. or eighteen months. Uh, so to me, it, it still ticks all the boxes. And of course, like a lot of uh, quality small cap stocks that are I think undervalued, very vulnerable to you know to takeover bids and similar from. Uh, from larger mm. predators, uh, I think this applies to a lot of UK companies at the present time. I think this this really leads on, in a way, to uh, how you actually handle an investment in a company that has been very mm. successful and where the rating, you know, does really almost get in the stratosphere. Now, looking back, I did sell some of my treat at, at probably double uh, the the present share price, um, and uh, before that. Uh, you know, I, I, I did sell some, but obviously and probably in crude financial terms, n- not enough. Right. Selling is probably the most difficult area to advise on. Mm. Uh, and, and no rule that you, you apply uh, for selling actually um, fits all circumstances. Yeah. And you say you'll never get it right every time. But I think that... Uh, you know, if you do invest in a company that develops a super rating where the it still seems a great business, but 
you know if the slightest thing goes wrong, either with the company itself or with overall sentiment in the market, it's very vulnerable because people are sitting on huge profits. It may well be sensible uh, as a rule of thumb, to, to, uh, and this takes some, some courage, say to sell mm. uh, a, something like a third of that holding, yeah. to, you know, to take a good slice off the, off the top. Yeah. No, I've not done that, but probably looking back, I think that's probably what I what I should have done. Yeah, and uh, you know, of course, hindsight is is always twenty twenty. I suppose we have the benefit of, of two years looking back. There's one point I think you you pointed out the other day, and I was going back through the share register and the R R and S's. So, in 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 twenty twenty one, kind of as the share price was peaking, the the outgoing CFO sold about four million pounds worth of shares now that was ahead of his retirement and he said and, and directors always say there's you know there are personal reasons for selling with hindsight that was a spectacularly timed uh, uh trade for for an insider yes. Uh, yes. there not that he was to know that you know the the market conditions that were, were going to lead to a lot of the, the the you know the depression in the share price i mean what's your, what's your approach to a director particularly director sales because we're talking about sales in the context of how hard they are to 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 do um, what goes through your mind when you, you see a chunky sale of, of, of someone who is... Uh, who, who's well, I can, tell, I can tell you what, what my view is now. Sure. And it's really hardened over the, yeah. over the years. And that is, if you see significant director selling, you take that as, a, as, as bad news, as a bear sign, uh, and you, you probably should, should dispose of some of, your, some of your holding. Now, when directors sell a chunky part of their holding, you know, they give a whole, whole mix of reasons... Um, for for you know wanting to buy another house, uh, a divorce, uh, their own personal taxation problems, or of course the, you know the the one that I find very unconvincing is uh, you know to help create market uh, liquidity. <laughs> the, 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 you know the institutions are clamouring for stock; they can't buy in the market, <laughs> and, and therefore you know they want the brokers and advisors want me to release. A percentage of my holding sort of thing so we, we get all these reasons uh, and you know obviously there is some validity uh, frequently in all of them but all I would say is a generalization from bitter experience if you see a key director making a significant and a big sale you know ignore the reasons as it were and regard that as a serious negative sign it certainly indicates that for example there are no takeover talks on at the moment because no way could a you know, could a or could a, a director sell if if they were engaged in some serious talks? Good point. Uh, and also, of course, if the company um, uh, if the company was was about to to announce a real a real positive trading statement and excellent results, then I would suggest that the director concerned would probably hold off selling mm. until he or she had benefited from that share price rise. So come back, see a big share sale by a director generally advisable to to follow likewise not necessarily with all one's holding but um with part yeah so very pleased to say that last uh last month's episode uh resulted in, in, in a few questions for you john a request was uh, was heeded and, and one of the questions was on the, the very theme that we've been talking about which was how you uh decide when to sell shares and, and and how you monitor the situation to make sure you make timely exits aside from directors deals and I get this a sort of sense of instinct that you 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 were talking about there when things feel a little toppy, but you still might believe in the business. What are other things that you'd you you might base a decision to 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 sell on? Well, I, th I generally speaking, I'm a long term investor, yeah. and I think uh, you know if I was criticising myself, and I do frequently, I probably too loyal to some companies um, uh, and stay with them. Uh, because I've got to know them mm. and got to know the, the people who run the business. I probably could not should have been more ruthless in certain cases. But on the other hand, you know, if I like the business and like the people and believe the business is fundamentally undervalued still and value I always believe will come through in the end, I tend to, uh, I tend to stay aboard. I, I do pay quite considerable regard to the phrases that companies use uh, in their trading statements and, and the comments of the chief executive and or the chairman and finance director. And, and you get to know the language of particular companies mm. uh, and whether they tend to be conservative or whether they tend to be particularly optimistic. Once again, broad brush, uh, chief executives uh, and finance directors are not, are not going to go on the record unless they're... they're 
you know, they're, they're total rogues and there are very, very few of those around, I'm glad to say. Um, you know, they're not, they, they don't want to say anything that makes them look, look stupid sure. um, in, in six or nine months' time when the actual results do come through. Mm. So normally they, most that I'm invested in anyway, tend to, uh, you know, be, be cautious and hopefully deliver rather more at the end of the day. Uh, but so the, the words that are used are, are, are extremely um, uh, important. Yeah. Before we turn to our, our final few sections, just want to jump back into Treat. We've talked a little bit about the, the valuation case and, and how you got in. I just want to just touch on a, a few parts of the um, the business itself. Mm. You know, it, I, I find it quite an opaque market in, in some senses that, you know, they're, they're both having to deal with public perception of what goes into food, but the products themselves are, are, are fairly niche and it's really a relationship between them and um, and the, the beverage or food manufacturers that they're, they're dealing with. Is it clear to you what the exactly what the, the end markets are here and, and, and what the the drivers are. I mean, does, does the, do you think the, the company does a good job in, in articulating those those? Uh, I th- I th- well, I think it does. I mean, to 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 pick up one or two of your points, I, I think only about twenty percent of of turnover is uh, synthetic. Yeah. To use that that word, they uh, or did buy from buy ingredients from about seventy different countries, and of course, this is a very old established business, as it were. So they have developed huge expertise mm. within their um you know within their uh, their technological capability and of course it, it is very much um you know a changing market and all the time you know that they're looking to 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 understand the trends so that a few years ago for example there was a big growth in in flavored beers mm. uh and they were involved and benefited from from that then then you had uh in america a couple of two three years ago the really big takeoff in in what was known as hard seltzers right which uh, i think was a drink sort of fizzy water a little alcohol and then uh, one or two ingredient twists that treat put in Mm. and treat were a supplier to the major vendor of uh, manufacturer in the states uh, of hard seltzers Uh, and but that market slightly waned slightly waned and now there are developments for example in in coffees and ice coffees and uh, and similar that's a, a new area and then of course there are whole growth areas of the world that treat so far haven't really touched like china for example i mean they tell me when i talk to them about about china and the opportunities there where where they you know they have a small small operation a small team uh, you know they tell me that there are a number of huge private Chinese drinks companies that we in the West probably have never heard of. Yeah. So I think you've got to be nimble, as it were. They work a lot, of course, with with the drinks manufacturers themselves. They have the close trading relationships with a lot of them. And, the, and there is a sort of a joint working mm. on some products. And, you know, just to come back to their new facility at Paris St. Edmunds, which I think cost about £30 million, which is, you know, absolutely mind-blowing, you know, really, if one has the opportunity of... Uh, of seeing it, you know, any major drinks company um, uh, visiting Treat there, you know, c- couldn't fail to be impressed um, by the, you know, the technology and the the quality of their laboratories and and uh, technicians. Uh, and of course, if you are a major drinks company uh, and you're planning a, a major new product line, you you really, with the best rule in the world, can't afford to take a risk of going to a very small, unproven flavors and fragrances house, as it were, because you you want to be sure that they have the, you know, the the the, the integrity and the capability and of the size to deliver the scale, which if 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 the product takes off, mm. uh, you know, is really needed, uh, and this of course is where you know, Treat does score as it becomes bigger uh, and uh, because of the technology that it has and the you know the the expertise that it's built up over the years yeah. in this in this drink supplying sector, which I suppose from a brand perspective, it can be. I think for an investor, it can be very hard to read, can't it? You know, picking the brands that are going to succeed is it's like fashion. It's like quite, quite an ephem- ephemeral thing. Sure, but the, the the treat investment cases will be supplying those brands, whatever um, whatever happens, because we have these long standing. Yes, I think once you once you get into a relationship with a major um, manufacturer. Uh, and it can take quite a long time, as it were, and and to get a, a manufacturer, a drinks manufacturer, 
to actually switch from from A to B. Mm. Uh, you know, it, it, it's a relationship you 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 know you want to retain, uh, and uh, hopefully there, there is mutual long term growth and benefit in in that. But I come back to one of the points that I made right at the start, that I think flavors and fragrance companies are valued much more highly mm. in Europe and in in uh, on the continent than they are in in this country because they're such a rare breed. Yeah. So we're going we're gonna to conclude the podcast um, today by touching on a, on a roundup of recent changes in your portfolio, John. We spent a, a good chunk of, of the last episode talking about MNG uh, as one of, the, one of the larger life insurers come asset managers in the city. I mean, this month you've been taking a bit of a closer look at Aviva, which is I know is a very popular holding with readers of our magazine, not least for its yield. Um, you've added to your position, which you, you had already. Why Why was that? Well, um, you know, I've been a fan of Aviva for some time, but then I became rather more enthused about um, uh, M&G because, I, you know, I thought the, the growth possibilities were greater there. The dividend yield was higher. The M&G dividend yield was sort of 10% plus, whereas uh, Aviva's was sort of 75 8, 8%. And I think, that, you know, there was quite a lot of takeover chatter about M and G, and that resurfaces from from time to time. Then I, I met the new chief executive of M and G, and was impressed with uh, with him, Andrea Rossi. And so I sold most of my uh, Viva holding, not all, but most of it, having done quite well, and built up my M and G holding. So the M and G holding actually uh, ha- has been built up, and probably is uh, as treat has come down. The M and G and treat holdings are about about the about the same. But nevertheless, I, you know, I've always liked uh, Aviva. And then a few weeks ago, we had the uh, sort of quite serious chatter about uh, a possible takeover for uh, Aviva. And half a dozen major international insurance, assurance firms were, were, were mentioned. Uh, and although Aviva is big, uh, it, 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 it's not um, beyond the capacity of some of these other major international insurance companies to actually go for it. And so the shares rose on that basis and then drifted back. Um, but my experience is that quite often, um, you know, when when there is serious comment about a possible takeover, particularly when uh, the names of half a dozen potential buyers are mentioned, as they were in the fairly serious article, often something does happen in time. So it seems to me that Aviva is frankly, um, you know, a wonderful each way bet. Mm. Uh, I think Amanda Blank has done a great job there. Full of optimism in terms of statements. You've got a, um, a rising dividend yield of around 7.5% now, something like that, uh, with the possibilities of a takeover thrown in. So it seems to me to be, um, you know, heads you win, tells you can't lose situation. But also I've been looking at, uh, I always do uh, look at, you know, the, 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 the what I term the sort of solid established small cap businesses. Mm. And so I've returned to um, a company called VP which is a plant hire company that I was invested in a long time ago, which is based in Yorkshire. Very solid record, uh, family controlled, dividend yield uh, also about 7.5% uh, and a clear a clear commitment to paying dividends. And there's a takeover story there. Isn't there it? was. The, the, what happened was that the controlling shareholder uh, put, effectively put the company for, up for sale probably yeah. 18 months ago. Uh, and when, it, when the shares were about twice the, the present share level, um, and then decided that the offers he received weren't weren't good enough, uh, and withdrew the the company from the the sale process. So he clearly believes that the shares, you know, are the company shares are worth more than the level then, which was about ten pounds, and now they're you know they're about half that, as it yeah. were. So to me, you know, a great solid little business which should do well. Also, you know, I, I've, I've talked to them relatively recently and try to get an understanding of the business. I mean, with a bit of luck, they should benefit from the um, increased infrastructure spend that um, the present government's talked about as compensation in the northwest for the for the cancellation of the HS2. of the of HS2 for the, the Birmingham to Manchester section. But then also looking ahead, I think it, it's accepted that there is likely to be a Labour government next time or a Labour-led coalition. Um, and there is a massive commitment there to infrastructure mm. uh, growth. Where they're going to get the money from is another matter. But anyway, that's what they're committed to. Now, that is going to mean, I think, um, significant business for construction companies and um, you know, quality 
um, smaller cap stocks that support that industry, like VP in Plant Tower, where they've got a number of subsidiaries, not just in this country, but actually some quite interesting growth opportunities uh, in, their, in their subsidiaries in Australia. Yeah. I mean, you, you've, ha- you've had a life in uh, politics, John. I mean, how, how important has been an awareness of political change been in your stock picking career? I mean, VP sounds like a bit of a play on the political outlook and the, you know, things move in cycles, don't they, and business cycles, but also there are political promises being made. It sounds like VP and others maybe are poised to capitalise on. You know, are the, the, the political pages of the of the Times as important um, as, as the business pages? When no, not, not, that, not as important, but they are, you know, they're, they're another piece on the jigsaw. Yeah. Uh, and when you're assessing a, a company or a sector, particularly with a company, you're, you're endeavouring to to build up a jigsaw on that company. You know, it, it's its executives, its track record, its dividend yield, its, its share rating, um, the comments of the, the you know, the, the, the most recent comments uh, from the, you know, from the board, from the chief executive, how are uh, political effect, uh, factors, if any, going to affect it? Could a change of government make a big difference? You know, will a, will a, a, an incoming government say that's got very, very positive uh, attitude to renewables and the environment and the green make life more difficult for, you know, some of the traditional companies, for example? Take tobacco companies, you know, is a government that's, that's going to, uh, you know, increasingly legislate against tobacco and the selling of vapes or similar uh, does that mean that there is a good investment case, as it were, and you have to weigh that up against the, you know, the, the fact the dividend yield available on tobacco stocks and and mm. the growth in so many third world countries in smoking, even yeah. though there may be a um, a reduction in in the Western world. So all the time you're you're building up these jigsaws. So to answer your question, uh, politics plays a, a part. But I would say, a, you know, a, a, a smaller part than, than the overall economic arguments. Before we conclude, I wanted to um, uh, put you another question we've, we, we had uh, since we last recorded. Um, to another listener, um, Tim, I think to mild umbrage with your, your comment last time that patience being one of the, the most important facets of successful investing. The question he, he, he wanted to ask uh, vis-a-vis patience is how... Uh, what, what the, the the right approach to to risk to potentially take over a, a time horizon of because um, I think there's you know some members of his family were feeling that the the risk is too high and he is is potentially keener to to push it on a little bit. Mm. What's what's the balance there? There's always an element of risk if you're buying a, an equity share, a share in a business, as it were. You're obviously taking a degree of risk, but of course you can you can minimise that. But nevertheless, there is always a risk there, and therefore I would always say to people. You know, do keep a percentage of your wealth in cash, in in the bank or or wherever you want to you want to keep it, um, for for what I term um, you know heart a heart bypass situation or a, or a family emergency. Yeah. So always keep some cash out. But then you, I think you should be taking you know the long term view, and this is why I believe that um, uh, patience is so is so important. Uh, common sense when you're choosing a particular company, but patience then you know one once you're invested in that business and if you want to make serious money in the stock market from my experience um you 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 get into a good co- company and stay with it mm. uh and the biggest mistake that most investors make is a chop and change take a little profit here decide something something that they bought isn't quite as good as something they read about this week and so they they move out of one into the other and of course incur costs in in doing that at the end of the day you know if you, if you, if you look back the, the history of successful investors the, the more uh, international names like the you know the warren buffets for example you know they've invested in companies and stay with them and of course the other point is is that you hope obviously for long-term capital growth but in the meantime uh, you can get a very attractive dividend yield as we talked about a little bit earlier and all I would say to to um, uh, t- is it Tim, Tim to Tim yeah. uh, is that I think uh, his family has come into money at a wonderful time to invest. Some great opportunities, both in in the large caps like the, you know, the ones we've mentioned, the Legal and Generals, the Vivas, the M and Gs, and there are any number of really good solid smaller companies where you can get dividend yields. So uh, I've certainly on paper 
lost money over the last two or three years in terms of the value of my overall portfolio. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, uh, I've seen a significant increase in overall dividend income and dividend yield, most of which I've been able to uh, plough back uh, mm -hmm. on a compounding basis because of the very attractive yields uh, that, that you can get tax-free uh, in an ISA. Always a good point. You may not need the income now, but you can certainly use the income um, to, to, to sort of further your investment ambitions. John, what's what's in the diary uh, just finally uh, over the next few weeks before we... we well, I'm, well I, I'm, I'm looking forward, for example, specifically to the... Um, well, let, let, well, I suppose in, 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 in overall terms, let us hope that um, before we meet again, you know, there is some sort of... Uh, Degree, some degree of peace in the, you know, in the, in the in the Middle East, and possibly also in the, with the Ukrainian situation. Although I suspect both will, both of those will, uh, will drag on. But what I'd like to see, of course, in the autumn statement, some measure that might give a boost to the UK stock market, where I think there are huge opportunities. It'd be very nice, for example, if to encourage investment in UK, in UK shares, even outside uh, an ISA. Um, you know, dividend income from UK companies up to a certain level was tax-free, for example. Mm. So the autumn statement will be quite interesting, particularly as it's maybe the last one before a, you know, a general election, likely um, uh, next year. Then in my case, I've got um, you know some company results coming up, like got Lock and Store, which will be coming up very soon. Uh, I'm looking forward to my uh, my M&G dividend, which is because of the dividend yield, uh, you know, a very nice dividend to, to have. So, uh, you know, the, the beauty about, about uh, investing in the stock market and following it as I do is that, you know, something always happens. Uh, good news, bad news, the unexpected. It's been a, a fascinating hobby of mine over the years, which has been a major part of my life. And, and thankfully, with more success than failures, um, it, you know, it's given me a degree of financial independence, which obviously, when you get to my stage and age, it is appreciated by uh, not only by myself, but for but um, uh, children and grandchildren. Yeah. Killing lots of birds with uh, the one stone Absolutely. there. Very good. Um, brilliant. There's a lot, lots to explore in the, in the next episode. It's worth me mentioning again that, um, that any questions... You'd, you'd like to put to John, um, you, you, you can do so by emailing me at alex.newman at ft.com and we'll we'll do our best to address any that you, you have or topics you'd like exploring in, in future episodes. Until then, all that's left for me to say is to thank you for listening. Thank you, John, for your thoughts again. My pleasure. And to thank our producer, Maddie Apthorpe, for all her work behind the soundboard. Until next time. Mm -hmm.